Thank you. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for your many blessings. Thank you for the opportunity to wake up to see this day. Um, thank you for this class, um, and Brother Page, and please help us take this class and um, be better people for you. Um, the, less, uh, the lessons and the, um, the, the work of this class that we take the, these, um, these verses and this, um, and, and, and this book uh, seriously and that we're able to um, um, grow in you and grow in spirit. And please um, help us to um, um, take this and be a better people for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, I appreciate that, brother. All right, so let's go ahead and, and get going for the week. Um, once again, I hope that you guys are really enjoying the study. Uh, you know, just getting a chance to go through this again, it was a, a good refresher for me because I hadn't gone through the material in a while. So uh, having a chance to, to go through and do this has been a great reminder of all of the good things that are contained in it. And I love this book because this book really ties in closely with the Word of God. You can tell that the author, he has uh, placed a plethora of scriptures throughout. Um, all of these principles that are talked about are really solid and really sound. Um, and, you know, getting a chance to really dig in and get some application out of it. I think that's really one of the, the most important keys out of everything that we do as we read and as we study and as we dive into the Word of God if we don't get the life application out of it, it really doesn't do us much good. Just like James tells us that faith has to be coupled with works in order to be effective. Uh, just having belief alone does not help you if you don't have the action behind it. So as we dive in and we study the word of God, and as we study throughout this class, if we don't turn around and then take the action, uh, then it's going, we're gonna find ourselves ineffective not as effective as we need to be as we go throughout this uh, life and all the things that we're trying to do. All right, so I'm going to share my screen here and then we will get going. Okay, share. All right, so I'm thinking everybody should be able to see it, but let me, uh, Henry, all right, there we go. <laughs> Appreciate it, Henry, let me know. All right, so here we are, the C principle. Again, the power of continuation part two. Uh, so this, this particular chapter, we're talking about the power of continuation. And as we've gone through the first four chapters, we talk about really the fundamental parts of the C principle, as far as gardening goes, um, you know, we need to be able to plant the seeds and then we need to be able to water the seeds. And you have all of these different things that you do to grow seeds. Uh, but then you get to the point where it becomes harvest time. OK, so we don't want all of our efforts to be in vain. Ultimately, we're all out to be able to reap uh, the benefit of some sort of result. Right. So once we get to the point of cultivating, once we get to the part of, of harvesting, that's when we take the sickle and we put it to the crop and we reap a result, all right? So there is a uh, quote here at the bottom of this that says that character consists of what you do on the third and fourth tribes, all right? So uh, it, it just speaks to the resiliency of continuation and the fact that you can't just expect to plant some seed and then hope that you can reap a harvest the next day. Um, if you plant a seed and it doesn't produce the way that you want it to, you don't just give up on life. You don't just starve to death. You go back and you recheck and you see, how was the soil? How was the seed? What was going on? Let me try this again. Did I do it in the right season? Okay, we have to have the spirit of tenacity to the point that we just continue and we have the power of continuation flowing through us. All right, so last week we talked about, uh, again, we, we got into this part where we are at the sickle. And when you get to the sickle, this is the harvesting season. So in the sickle, we talk about showing the change. Okay, so this is when the change starts to take place in your life. Um, as I have planted certain principles, right? We all come with different backgrounds and different things that we grew up with. So uh, as you start to walk with God and you let the Holy Spirit come in and transform your life, you're going to find yourself uh, needing to see the results, okay, that take place. 
And that's where we get to the, the sickle, the result. This is when we start to see things uh, take place as far as the changes. Okay. And then we talked about the three principles of the law of the sickle. So as we get to the point where we want to start harvesting change in our lives, we're going to take a look at faith, fortitude, and focus. All right. So once we focus in on, on those three things and we have our faith in line, because in order to produce change in your life, you first have to believe that change is possible. It doesn't, you're never going to even get to the point where you walk over the threshold of change. You're not even going to approach the doorstep of change if you don't believe that you can actually make changes in your life. If you don't believe that God's spirit is powerful enough to make changes in your life, uh, this is not going to work for you. Okay, so once you get that faith going and enough faith to get you to take action, you have to have fortitude, which means that you have to have resilience. Like this is what we were just talking about. Um, the fact that, hey, I'm, I've gotten here and I face a little bit of difficulty and I can't fold like a tent on a windy day the first time uh, difficulty faces my life. I have to have the fortitude to be able to continue to march on through that. And then one of the things that's going to help you with your fortitude, uh, fortitude is your focus. What are the things that you are focused on, right? So if your focus is on uh, trying to have the easiest life possible, if your focus is on, uh, you know, different other distractions and things of the world, and there's, there's Facebook and there's Twitter and, you know, what did the president tweet today? And, uh, you know, what's going on in the latest news cycle? There's so many things to take your focus off. And when your focus is off, you cannot be effective. So we need faith, fortitude, and focus in order for us to reap the type of results we're looking for. And then lastly, we talked about growth, right? The process of growth is difficult to observe, but it's always happening. So this is, is, very, this is a very important point for us because the type of society we live in, you know, again, being 21st century Americans, um, Man, this is the have it your way microwave society. Okay. We talked about this before. We got, you know, so much food. They needed GMO food to make it grow faster. All right. The, the, the natural chickens, the way that they grow, they don't grow fast enough. They don't grow big enough. We got to shoot them up with hormones. Uh, we need to genetically modify plants to get them to grow faster. Uh, we cannot sit down and just have a home cooked meal. We got to pop that thing in a microwave to make it go faster. We, we want things instantly and instant results is just not biblical. Okay. So you, you have to understand that when, when the Bible talks about the seed principle in this parable, Jesus is trying to get us to understand that there's a process to things and it goes completely against our culture because we're so used to having things fast. You know, I was talking to a brother this week about the uh, apparent demise of our favorite football team. And as soon as Mike McCarthy came in, Super Bowl, <laughs> right? Everybody's thinking it was going to get fixed overnight. I am trying to have patience with my team. But, you know, one of the things that I do understand, it's a process. This is a brand new system. This is a brand new defense. Um, they shouldn't be playing as poorly as they play. But at the same time, it's not going to be changed overnight. We want overnight success in everything. I was talking to someone else recently about some financial matters, right? And uh, so during this whole pandemic, there's, there's been a lot of creative ways that people are trying to earn income uh, through whatever this group and cooperative economics and, and a lot of this stuff, right, is, is fine. But as I've talked to this person, I say, you know, a lot of times we get attracted to the quick money. And I said that it just violates a natural principle. You know, fast money, it's, it's like the lottery. A million people will play the lottery and one of those million people are gonna hit. <laughs> but these results are not typical. 999,999 people are going to go home with lost money. Uh, so this fast stuff, it doesn't happen overnight. You have to, if you wanna have financial abundance, you need to plant some seeds and it takes years, all right? It takes, it's a process to reach that. Some of us, when we start weight loss goals, you know, we, we give up on it because after a week, the scale didn't move fast enough for us. So, it's, you know, it did, you didn't put on 50 pounds in a week and you're not gonna put it off in a week. It took you years to get 
those love handles. So it's gonna take a little while, all right? You gotta have patience, but you gotta understand the process. There are things going on. That first week you worked out, your body is going through some changes. They may not reflect themselves as much on the scale, but you gotta understand that's a process taking place. When I get baptized and I come out that water and I still wanna smoke a cigarette, it's all right, man. <laughs> you know, sanctification is a process. It takes time. You got to let the Holy Spirit come in and do his work. You're not going to reach your end goal overnight. So we got to be patient and we have to be persistent and we have to work. All right. Eventually, as the Spirit's working with you and you are studying, and you are reading and you are being around people uh, who are presenting positive influences, you'll find your desire to do things that you normally uh, should be doing, you'll find those desires start to die down, all right? But we cannot expect overnight success. So know that the growth is happening even when you cannot see it. It's taking place. You just have to keep going. All right, now let's talk about status symbols because this is the world that we live in and the author makes a point about, you know, status symbols, all right? And the world has its version of status symbols and then we have our version of status symbols. So when you look at the status symbol of the world, uh, here are some of the things we look at. Gucci, Louis Vuitton, Prada, you know, fashion. Everybody loves all this fashion stuff. I was talking to a, uh, my banker actually, he was talking about uh, his kids. He has some kids in high school and the pressure that's on these young people to go out and have things like Gucci backpacks. It boggles my mind. Um, this backpack is like $1,500 for a backpack that does the same thing that the $30 backpack from Target does, except it's got that Gucci name on it. And these kids are pressured. So this young man went out and he saved up all summer and bought two Gucci backpacks. And it's insane, <laughs> all right? So um, what are we chasing? We're chasing, we're chasing status symbols. The, the cold thing about it is that Gucci don't even really like you like that. You know, these, they don't really even fool with people who look like you, but you go and pour all your money into this stuff. This is the stuff that the people in the world chase. What else do we chase in the world? Big homes, right? I pulled this up. This is a $12 million home in Lucas, uh, if you're interested, and you can just swing it like that. So this is a real home <laughs> in Lucas, Texas. So $12 million home, big homes, right? You, you're thinking that you came up and you made it. What else do we like? Luxury cars. All right, you're gonna have something like this in your driveway. And red bottom shoes from the ladies in the house. Hopefully just ladies, hopefully. Uh, you know, y'all know, right? There's, there's certain, certain shoes got those red bottoms and it's, it's a status. You, you can see the red when they're walking, right? That's, that's intentional. It's supposed to put you at a certain status symbol. So when I get to the point and I, I'm, you know, if I'm able to rock all of these items, in the eyes of the world, I have experienced success. This is a status symbol. It, it makes you look and feel a certain way. And we've gotten to the point now where, so if you can't buy the red bottoms, this is a real product. It is red shoe sole paint, where you can take your Payless heels and paint the bottom of them red and act like you got on some Louboutins, all right? so. That's what the world status does for us. It makes us want to chase these types of fantasies and chase these types of symbols. But we know that we are in this world, but not of this world. So what are the type of things that we're going to be looking at? What are the status symbols of the kingdom of God? How about love? All right. So when you see my love overflowing and in and, and the kingdom of God, we just measure things differently. You have somebody who you see an abundance of love flowing out of. And you'd be like, man, they balling with love. All right. So it's a different level. We have different standards in the kingdom of God. What about joy? All right. I have so much joy overflowing. This is a status symbol of people in the kingdom of God. Peace. All right. So a lot of y'all already know where I'm going with this. Is you can call out where the scripture is in Galatians. Love, joy. Peace, okay, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, 
and self-control. So we're talking about the difference between worldly status symbols and people who are citizens of the kingdom of God, their status symbol. If I can, you know, chase those things in a world, it makes me look a certain way to them. But I'm not concerned about what you think about my status so much as I should be concerned about what God thinks about my status. So when God is looking at me, I want my status symbol. I want to be balling like this. Where I'm ever increasing in my joy, I'm ever increasing in my gentleness and I'm ever increasing in my self-control. That's bringing up my spiritual net worth. And these are the type of things that we're going to chase as kingdoms, uh, citizens in the kingdom of God. And this, of course, comes from Galatians chapter 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the spirits, right? This is the fruit of the spirit. This is how you know that you're making progress in the spirit and in the kingdom is the fact that you start to see these things manifest themselves more heavily. So it's not about the car in your driveway or whatever it is that you're pulling it up to or the shoes on your feet, or the clothes on your back. All of those things will make you look a certain way in the world. And you can be beautiful on the outside, but completely rotten on the inside. We don't wanna be that way. We wanna be first beautiful on the inside. And then you can, and I'm not knocking the other things, okay? If if you can afford the $12 million house in Lucas, God bless you, That's, that's fantastic, right? as long as you have this in line first, all right? So you're working from the inside out and not from the outside in because the stuff that happens on the outside, it will never affect who you are as a person. You know, the the Louis Vuitton, it can't make me clean on the inside. I may look clean on the outside, but it cannot affect my inner man. All right, so we're making sure that we focus on these things and we need to make sure that we stay encouraged throughout this process You know, we talked last week about how these things that we're discussing, they're they're always good, but they're not always easy. All right, so I'm not going to sit here and just pretend like those those items that we just talked about from the fruits of the spirit, that it's just a a walk in a park and you're going to uh, be marvelous at those things in a week or a month or even 20 years or 30 years. You're going to spend the rest of your life trying to perfect and, and complete and build up those characteristics inside of yourself. It's a journey that you're gonna continue to be on. So you have to stay encouraged. To keep from losing heart, the sower must keep these things in mind, okay? That it's a process. And what we're doing is we're breaking down this scripture, Galatians chapter six, verse number nine. And you can see when you read it at the bottom, um, it says, let us not grow weary. And right there in bold, it says, while doing good. So the process that's required to, in order for me to get where I need to go is the doing good, okay? So this is the process. And then once I start the process, I need to be able to focus on the promise, the promise that doing good inspires, which is what? In due season. And you see that uh, highlighted at the bottom as well, in bold, for in due season. This is the result that I'm shooting for, and this is what I'm aiming for, all right? So I need to know that all of this good that I'm trying to do, and all of this love, and all of this joy, and peace, and this kindness, and this goodness, and patience, and the whole nine, all the work that it takes in developing these things, it's not for no reason, it's not in vain, all right? So in due season, I will reap. This is the product that you desire. Okay, and you see that once again in bold at the bottom. So as I'm going through it, again, I'm building out these things. There is a season that I will reap. And I love the application of this, obviously on the spiritual standpoint, because we can take this and apply directly to the spiritual. But just like we talked about, Uh, In the first couple of classes, these principles work everywhere. That's why I continue week after week to talk about how you can take this to not only enhance your spiritual life, but to enhance your health goals. Again, apply to that thing. When I talked about 
You get discouraged because you look on a scale and the scale ain't moving fast enough for you. Take this. <laughs> All right. What's the process? While I trim my meal portions. OK, while I enhance more vegetables and less starchy foods. All right. And while I go through and again, uh, more activity, I go on a walk after dinner every night. All of these little things, what is that? That's process. That's the good that you're doing. What's the promise? That in inspires in due season, I will drop these love handles. In due season, my cholesterol levels will be normal. In due season, my blood pressure will be normal. Okay? And that's, of course, the product that we desire. That's what you're going to reap is... Hey, I have energy. I have vitality. I got a normal blood pressure. I, you know, I'm no longer at risk for heart disease. I took the same principle and I apply it to my health. You apply it to your relationships. If your marriage is rocky, you can take these same three steps and use that to enhance the quality of your marriage. Or what if you have a long uh, relative that you got an estranged relationship? Let's say, you know, I'm not the closest to my dad. Or I'm not the closest to my mom. And, you know, we, we've been fighting for years and we just kind of distant. But I love this person and I want to mend. I can take this process. It works on relationships, too. I'm struggling and, and I'm having a hard time making ends meet. And there's things going on. There's a pandemic. I was struggling before the pandemic. I'm struggling during the pandemic. And I feel like I'm going to be struggling after the pandemic. Take this. Apply it to your career and your business and your finances. The principle works everywhere. It's the beauty of God's uh, universal laws that he created. And obviously the spiritual application. We talked about this before. There's so many things that need to be done in the kingdom of God. Uh, there's so many ministries. There's so many uh, talents that we're supposed to be putting to use in God's kingdom. And we say, take this and apply it. I'm in the middle of this study and I've been telling this person about the church for years and they just ain't listening. Take this. It's okay. You may be the one to uh, plant the seed. Maybe somebody else is supposed to come and water it later on, and God gets the increase at the end of it. All right? So the process, the promise, and the product, and then this last one is the prerequisite required. The prerequisite says don't give up, and that's at the very end of the verse. Do not lose heart. So you take this fourth thing, and you say, all right, um, these first three things are good. You know, I'm going to be doing good and I'm going to have an inspiration of this thing that, that, you know, in due season, I'm going to reap. And that last point, don't miss that fourth point because that's key. Don't give up. Part of your continuation before you ever get a chance to pull out that sickle and reap something out of the harvest you have to be diligent about continuing in this process. Only a foolish farmer would plant seed, water it two or three times, and then go away and never come back to it again. I'm a city guy. I don't have a green thumb. But even I can tell you that ain't going to work. <laughs> Dog ain't going to hunt. You have to continue watering. You have to continue fertilizing. And when something starts to sprout, you're going to have to keep the bugs off of it. You're going to have to cultivate the ground and start digging the, the weeds out. Your life is not set it and forget it. The things that you're looking to accomplish, the things that God has put you here to do, you can't put it on cruise control. It's going to require effort and not giving up for the rest of your life. OK, I hope that's not discouraging for you guys. I hope that you are encouraged. I just, you know, this, this is you want to shoot straight. You want to give it real. This is what the Bible tells us. Do not lose heart. You have to keep going. And in keeping uh, with your continuation, you need to make sure that you're sowing the right seeds. So in order to sow the right seeds in your life, number one, the author brings this out. You need a clear purpose. OK, so I need to understand exactly what it is that I want to do. Um, you cannot have hazy goals. I gave this illustration before talking about if I wanted to drive from Dallas to Los Angeles, I wouldn't just get in my car and drive west. 
event. I mean, that might get me to New Mexico. I might, you know, end up on the wrong side of the tracks. I know California's West, but I have to have a clear purpose, which means I have to have a specific thing in mind. Okay, so you got to know where you're going. Then you have to have a hopeful attitude. Hope is belief. You have to understand, I have to believe that I can actually get from point A to point B. And what, you know, what is your belief based on? All right, so your belief can be based on many things. Number one, your belief should be based on the fact that if God called you and commissioned you to do something, that he's going to give you what it takes to get there. God is not an absentee father. If he asks you to do something, he's going to provide you with the tools. So when I ask my son to go cut the yard, I need to provide a lawnmower. And if God has given you specific instructions, okay, and if you're supposed to grow in your love and your joy and your peace and all of these things, as the, the spirit continues to strengthen in your life, you have to understand your hopeful attitude. You got to believe that you can put the cigarettes down. You got to believe that you can stop calling up that girl. You can stop calling up that guy. You got to believe that by God's power, I can stop clicking on certain websites. You got to believe. Okay. Hopeful attitude, dogged persistence. Next thing that you need, you need to sow the seed of dogged persistence, which means that once my belief is strong enough, I continue to dig into this day in and day out. Got to believe. I hate to continue to use Dallas Cowboys examples, but I got one more for you. So what was this? Two weeks ago, right? And what's now called the watermelon kick. The most ridiculous thing is they're playing the Atlanta Falcons. They were good as dead. I almost turned the game off because I was so frustrated. I refrained from throwing things. I just kept watching it. And here they go. Go down, score a touchdown. Go down, score a touchdown. All hope is lost. Nobody expected them to be able to recover an onside kick. That does not happen in the NFL these days. And so this weird thing comes out and he kicks it and, and, and you know, it starts spinning and they get hypnotized by it and decide not to jump on the ball. And then we get a recovery and then Dak still has to go down and get them in scoring range and they still got to kick a field goal. Dogged persistence. The belief was strong on that team. Most of the fans had given up. If you ask Jerry Jones, he probably would honestly say he didn't expect it to win. The owner of the team gave up. But the, the, the players on the field, the ones who were executing, they went out there with this persistence and they kept going. So as bad as it looks, even when the Messiah has been crucified and taken off a cross and buried in a tomb and everybody's ready to give up, dogged persistence. Uh, you got to believe that what Jesus said he was going to do, that he's going to do. And he did. All right. So we got to be able to have the type of faith to keep going. And when we can have these three things in mind, we will reap incredible results. Love this verse. Matthew 9, 37 says, then he says to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. All right. The reason I, I love what Jesus says here is because Jesus is emphasizing the importance of work. This again, you gotta get this into your soul. <laughs> you gotta bear, you gotta, you gotta get this into your spirit. The only way to get a crop is to put in work consistently, solid, over years, over time. Lazy people don't reap anything. So when it comes to the growing the kingdom of God, we, we saw, uh, you go through and you read the New Testament and you read the book of Acts, and it's amazing, the workers that are in there. You see Peter and you see uh, John and you see, you know, the early disciples, you see the work that they were putting in. And then Paul comes and he is the scene later and he outworks them all. It was just work, okay? The process of building something and growing something. Yes, you get tired. Yes, you get frustrated. Yes, sometimes you cry. Yes, sometimes you have sleepless nights. Will it be stress? Yes. All right? Not going to lie to you. Yes. All of that is coming. But you got to be ready to put in the labor. So later on, Jesus uh, says, 
pray that the Father will send laborers into the vineyard. There are souls out there that need to be saved. There are people who need to know God's message and God's gospel. People need to be saved on two accounts. Number one, their soul. And number two, their lives. Okay? These people, you know, people who are not living, once again, I'm out here and I'm, I'm smoking, I'm drinking, and I'm, I'm, I'm running this and doing that. Your soul needs to be saved in your life, your current life. You holistically improve when you start getting the Holy Spirit and that love, joy, peace, and all of those things that are mentioned in the fruit of the Spirit working in your life. It increases your overall uh, person, okay? And this world needs that. So let's talk about how to make hazy goals clear. Because once again, that clarity is, is very important. You cannot just go into life aimlessly hoping that you, you hit some sort of target. You make your hazy goals clear by number one, thinking. Okay, take some time to think. Thinking is hard work. And if you don't think it is, just go back to your school days. Just think about your least favorite subject. <laughs> some of y'all hate math. All right, some of y'all hated English. Some of y'all hated social studies. Some of y'all hated science. Why? The level of thinking required to advance in that. It was just, so thinking is work. It's, it's hard work, but you got to put it in. Number two, speaking. Okay, speaking. We talked about this a few weeks ago when we talked about the importance of speaking to encourage yourself. All right, so we know that we speak to encourage one another through psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, right? Um, we read about that in Colossians. And not only just speaking to encourage one another, but we speak to encourage ourselves because whatever goes out of your mouth goes into your own ears. So you need to be able to speak and uh, make sure that you're speaking clearly about the things that you want to do. Number three, writing. Writing, this is such an important skill to be able to write your goals down. That helps to clearly define it. Um, you know, my wife talks about me because sometimes I'm, I'm really interested in like the brain, <laughs> this, this marvelous mind that God created. And I'll read some really geeky stuff and sometimes I'll listen to some things and it talks about how the brain works and whatnot. Um, but one of the things, when you want to talk about learning, right? One of, one of the key ways to be able to learn something, you have to get as many of your senses involved as possible. That helps things to stick. If you think about all the tasks that your brain has to, to take on on a daily basis, your brain right now is making your heartbeat, uh, it's, you know, it's sending blood throughout your entire body, it's uh, you know, doing functions and all kinds of things that are going on. And consciously, you know, you're listening to me talk, you're doing all sorts of things, right? So the brain, with everything that it has to do, it tries to be efficient and it optimizes. So when it comes down to my goals or something that I want to learn, you want to take the time to try to get as many of your senses involved as possible. So thinking, okay, speaking. Speaking involves another sense. It involves the ears. When I write, what does write do? Writing involves my tactile senses, which means I'm taking the time, picking up a pencil, and also when I write, I am looking at visual. I got a visual uh, clue of what's going on and that's sending more information to my brain. So the more of your senses you can get involved in something that you're trying to do or learn, the more that helps to stick into your mind and let your mind know that, hey, this is something that's really important, all right? I know you're trying to be efficient and you wanna put some things on the back burner, but writing, writing is an important part. Also, writing helps you get the things, the inspirations that come to you out. You got to get it out on paper. How many of you guys have had some ideas and you thought it was such a brilliant idea and you said, man, this is great. I will never forget it. And then you take a nap and uh, have dinner and the thing left you. <laughs> like, man, I can't remember. This has happened to me so many times. So understand that the shortest pen is longer than the longest memory. All right, take some time to pull out a pen and write down inspiration when it hits you. And that will bring clarity to the things that you're trying to do. Sharing, okay, sharing is another important part of it. Something really becomes real when I take the time to share it with somebody else, all right? Accountability. 
So at the beginning of this class, we talked about finding an accountability, uh, accountability buddy, somebody who you would go through this course with, and you're going to share your goals and the things that you're trying to do and the things that God has inspired. Uh, and you feel like, you know, this is this thing, I just need to do it, but I haven't done it. And there could be a hundred reasons why. I just, I know that I should be doing this, but I haven't done it. Well, once I share my goal with somebody, I can't hide from it anymore. Right? So, you know, if I tell Brother Hart, say, Brother Hart, I want to go to, you know, preaching school and I want to learn how to preach. And, and, and this is something that I feel like God put on my heart. It's not, but we're using this for an example. And Brother Hart said, okay, all right, I got you. And then two weeks later, Brother Hart's like, so have you enrolled yet? And I say, yeah, about that. <laughs> All right. So I, I, I put myself in a situation to be held accountable once I told him about it. A lot of times we want to keep our goals to ourselves so nobody can call us to the carpet. You got to share that thing. OK, there has to be somebody in your life who is close enough to you that you can share your goal with so that they can hold you accountable. And hopefully there are some other people that have shared goals with you and you can hold them accountable. All right. Philippians 4 8 says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, anything worthy of praise, think on these things. Okay, so we have to be able to focus on things that we need to do and that God has called us to do in order to make our hazy goals clear. And then we want to make sure and this is very key. Not only are you making your goals clear, but you're making sure that your goals are in alignment. You have to align your goals with God. Psalm 37, 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. So if you delight yourself with God, God will turn around and give you the things that you're supposed to desire. All right. So how do I delight myself in God? I'm delighting myself in God by making sure that Number one, I'm staying in his word. I'm understanding the things that he has told me that I need to do. The Holy Spirit, who is uh, one of his jobs, is to remind you, to serve as a reminder. He cannot remind you of something that you have never learned. So if you want God's spirit to function well in your life and help you by reminding you of scriptures that you read, you best go read some scriptures. Okay, you better get your study on and be able to have things in your, your mind that you have planted. God planted seeds in your mind from what you studied. And then when you need those things, you have God's helper reminding you. Okay, but you cannot be reminded of what you have not learned. So if you want God to give you the desires of your heart. And by desires of your heart, I don't mean that, that first slide with the Louis Vuitton and, and uh, the Gucci bag. And the $12 million house. That's not what we're talking about. God giving you the desires of your heart. We're talking about God taking the desires that you should have and implanting them in your heart. So if my focus is on a $12 million mansion and my focus should be on uh, building an orphanage. And when I delight myself in God, that $12 million mansion becomes less important my desire for that decreases and the desire for building the orphanage increases. I say, man, I could go buy this mansion, but I don't even want it anymore. I see a bigger need. I see a better use for $12 million than going and buying this thing. What happened there? God gave me the desires that I should have. He transplanted the desires within me. Okay, he created in me a clean heart, as the next scripture says, Psalm 5110, and renewed a steadfast spirit within me. So not only will God give you the desires that you should have and taking away those things that you may feel like you love now, but you delight yourself in God and he removes those things slowly from you and puts the right things in you. Then he gives you a steadfast spirit so that you can stay strong and stay steady on your goal to achieving those things that he put on your heart. And he will not only give you that steadfast spirit, but he will renew the steadfast spirit. 
So when I'm working on it and I'm getting beat down, because yes, when you go to work on your goals, you will experience a little bit of mental beat down. You will get some emotional beat down. God is giving you the renewal of that spirit. He's not dropping the spirit on you one time, set it and forget it. But every time you need a refresher, God's spirit is there to constantly refresh you, get you to where you need to be. All right, so we talked previously about beginning with the end in mind. When you uh, see and feel the goal is achieved, it will give you the direction and motivation to manifest it in the material world. You just have to make sure that those goals align with God's purpose. All right, so once I can visualize those things, and once again, uh, get, get your entire mind involved, get your, your, your thinking faculties, get your emotion involved, get, you know, really get in sync with this thing, okay? This vision that God has given you, this thing that you know you're supposed to do, feel it, see it, all right? Get involved with it emotionally and then go out and attack it. But before you start attacking the goal, make sure it's in alignment. Now, group discussion. All right, so we uh, spend the next 10 minutes, we're gonna go into our group discussion and we're going to talk about uh, you know, some of the things that we covered tonight. What we wanna do is focus in on that last point. We're gonna talk about what can we do to make sure that our goals are aligned with God. All right, so we wanna discuss specific tactics that you can apply this week to help keep you on track. So once again, the question on the floor, you guys go ahead and start thinking about this, okay? As we're gonna come and we're gonna answer this and have group discussion. And the question is, what can you do this week to make sure that your goals are aligned with God? Specific tactics that you can apply uh, to keep yourself on track for this week. All right, so I'm gonna stop this share and I'm going to open it up. All right, so at this point in the class, if you guys uh, don't mind, if you're in a position to turn your camera on, we love to see the faces. I, I, I love to see the faces anyway. Uh, no pressure to do so. So, you know, if you happen to uh, be in a bathrobe or something like that, don't turn your camera on. <laughs> Only if you're decent, turn your camera on so we can have a group discussion together. All right. So now, what do you guys think? What can we do to make sure that our goals are aligned with God? This is Carol Brown. Just a brand. And well, one of the things is, even if I am trying to exercise and eat right to lose weight, then I don't skip Bible, sc Bible study to go to the gym. Hmm. All right. That's, yeah, that's really good, right? So, obviously, uh, God would have us to be in good health. I, I think that you can, you can obviously see that. Um, and the fact that we need health to be able to carry out his will. But she makes a very key point, okay? You have to have your life in the right priorities, which means that um, you need to be able to get both done. I never look at life as an either or proposition. I either go to Bible study or I do a workout, all right? Prioritize. So you're going to give God his time first, and then you're going to make sure that you uh, bump something else, maybe less important out the way, like watching television, and use that for your workout time. All right, so, good point. Appreciate that. Paul? Yes. This is Lorraine Smith. We need to keep praying and pressing on that we know in due season we will get our reward. All right. Prayer. Uh, that's that's going to be one of the answers to almost anything in life. A prayer you can apply across the board. We're told to pray without ceasing. So it's obviously something important for us. So pray and press on. That is a good tactic. I love that. Thank you. Charles? Yes. This is Hattie Jones. I would say uh, one of the things uh, I could do is see where I'm falling short or where I need to be short up. 
and uh, find those scriptures and write them down and then focus on those. You know, read those, you know, in addition to whatever else I'm, you know, reading to keep myself on track. All right. Thank you, Sister Jones. Keeping yourself on track. And I like what she said. The first thing you need to do is some self-reflection. Okay. All right. She said, find the areas where I am short, where I'm falling short. Um, and then find specific scriptures to attack those things. Uh, that's, a, that's a great tactic. And that's something that we should always be doing. Because every one of us on this Zoom, every one of us, we fall in short in some area. And you have to be self-aware and understand uh, what you need to be working on. So good one. Thank you. Charles? Yes. This is Drew. Drew Green. I think what's really essential is that, number one, you have to know what your gift is. Because uh, you have to know what your gift is that God has given you. Like my wife, she has lots of gifts. I mean, she has a, a gift for of hospitality, Amen. of uh, cooking, and she uses that gift. She uses her gift way more than I use my gift. My gift is, you know, teaching and preaching. If I ever get with uh, get with the brethren, we'll, we'll get that done. But um, you got to know what your gift is. You got to know what God put you on this planet to do. And you got to use that gift. That's, that's where you're going to be the, you know, get the most joy, knowing that you're 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 doing that which God has has uh you know, Bible every good and perfect gift comes from above, coming down from the Father of lights, in whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So you gotta know what your gift is and you gotta be willing to use your gift, basically. There you go. And uh I, I co sign on all of that. Right? And I'm I'm really big on gifts and exactly what he said. Why did God put me here? There is a general um, accountability, there, there's a general expectation that God has for all of mankind, right? So we know that we're all supposed to uh, fear God. We're all supposed to keep his commandments. We're all supposed to give honor. We, we have commandments that were written. Um, we have instructions that were given, and they apply to humanity. So there are things that apply to 7 billion people, <laughs> you know, including me, including all of you guys. That's God's general expectation for mankind. It's important to know that and understand that so that you can walk in alignment with God. But then there's something that's um, a little less obvious, and that is you, your specific gifts, your specific talents. So he highlighted some of the things that his wife has, right? He, he can see, you can see exactly uh, what people start to use their gifts and they become, uh, they manifest themselves. And then he talked about his gifts. Okay, so this goes back into self-awareness. We were just talking about self-awareness. So don't stop at understanding God's general expectation for mankind. Do that, learn that, and then really dig into what God specifically put you here for, the talents that he put in you, because you owe those to him. You owe your talents to God, mm -hmm. and you owe your talents to us. Go read 1 Corinthians 12, all right? One body, many members, which means that if you are a foot in the body of Christ, you owe that to the church. Mm -hmm. If you are a hand in the body of Christ, if you are a mouthpiece in the body of Christ, you owe those gifts to the kingdom of God. So yes, it's important to recognize that. I'll shout that from the mountaintop. Uh, so I'll amen that all day long, but you, you're spot on with that. That's going to help you in aligning your goals with God is understanding the specific goals, uh, the talents and gifts that God put in you. And then you can exercise those uh, in your alignment. Appreciate that. Okay, this is Shirley Hawkins. Uh, one of the things that I struggle with is trying to guard, guard my heart. I have to be careful about um, things that I expose myself to, like on the TV and social media, you know, I have to kind of step back and, and uh, you know, take a break from it because it can, um, you know, turn you sour and uh, prevent you from doing the things that you should do. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I agree. And it's interesting, interesting you bring that up because you, we've been talking so far about these offensive mechanisms, right? These things that we can apply uh, to help our offense. But what she just mentioned is something defensively. This is a defensive mechanism. Okay. So how do I help with attaining and achieving the goals that God gave me? Well, I can start by blocking out the things that he did not give me, <laughs> the things that will take me off of my goals and the things that will distract me, right? So not only should I pursue the things he gave me to do, but I must then flee things that he uh, put on here that I should not be doing. I must flee anything that will take me off of my course. I must flee the distractions of the world that cause me to lose focus on God. So I appreciate that, offense and defense. Um, let me read a couple from the comments because we've had some things come into the chat. Uh, Sister Pickens says, you can categorize scriptures and then refer back to them when needed. So I think that's a, that's a great suggestion, right? You go through in your study, you sort of create your own reference guide of scriptures that you can go back and refer to. Uh, Brother Hurd says, start each day with God, right? So I'm beginning my day with God. And maybe specifically that goes to starting with prayer, uh, starting with study, uh, starting with something, right? Starting your day with God. Uh, Sister Medina says, ask what you don't know. Ask a mentor or an elder. And I think that's great, right? So mm -hmm. God has given us advisors and, and people who we can talk to. So if you don't know something or you don't understand something, or to go back to Andrew's point, God has given me these gifts, but I, I may not be clear on what my gifts are. Maybe I'm a little hazy. Maybe I don't fully understand how to apply. What, what is this unique talent that God gave me? I, I know I'm supposed to be doing something, but I don't know what. So what she's saying is find an elder, find a mentor, talk to some other people, right? Who can help you discover your gift. They can say, you know what? You're the best at this thing. I've always known you to be this thing. You say, you know what? Okay, well, maybe that's my thing. Five people have told me that I'm hospitable. So maybe my gift is hospitality. All right? Mm -hmm. Appreciate mm -hmm. that. So Starbone says, beginning your day with gratitude, counting our blessings and thanking the Savior every day. Mm -hmm. I love that too. Begin your day with thankfulness. Okay, so uh, we talked about that, I think, about two weeks ago, right? Having the gratitude all the time. That attitude of gratitude keeps us on the right track. Uh, Sister Whitlock says, it is essential to surrender our goals daily to God, right? So yes, we need to mm -hmm. surrender whatever it is to God. All right, let's go back to the, uh, the class. Were there any other thoughts on how we can align our goals with God? Brother Paige, this is Marshawn Jackson. Yes, ma'am. Um, this is just bringing to mind a sermon, and I don't know if anyone else in the class remembers uh, Brother Gibbs preach uh, a sermon. It was January 12th because I had a lot of notes about making a decision for 2020. Everyone was resolution driven for 2020, but he was saying, make those tough decisions, make those hard decisions. And he said something that really, really uh, helped me. He said, make the decision based on a core belief based on your relationship with God. And that really helped me, especially for 2020, instead of making these New Year's resolutions, make a decision and start making goal-driven decisions that are God-focused. And that helped me eliminate a lot of things in my life that was not uh, God-based. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, so that, that, that ties right in to what we've been teaching. I want to highlight Sister Jackson real quick because taking notes. All right. So if you want to align your goals with God's goals, when you're in classes and when you're in sermons and you're listening, she was able to refer back to something that happened, you know, 10 months ago. <laughs> Remember what I said? The shortest pen is longer than the longest memories. Yeah, I've heard some great sermons in my life and I can, you know, if I didn't write it down, I, I can go back to something that Brother Gibbs taught back in 2015. But if I have those notes, 
right? Then I can go back and I can reference that. So I think that's uh, fantastic. Uh, Whitney Williams, Sister Williams says, have your accountability partner help you and make sure that they're aligned. So that's another good one, right? So whatever my accountability partner, somebody, so Brother Hart is going to hold me accountable for that thing I told him. Uh, even though it, was, it wasn't a real goal, I need to give him a real one so he can really hold me <laughs> accountable. Uh, Sister Pickens says, the olive tree, Bible app is a good resource. Okay, so that is good. Uh, another resource. Uh, I'm going to read a couple more. It says, Linda, Sister Linda, my goal should be bigger than me. In other words, they should benefit or service, uh, provide service to other people. Amen to that, right? Your goals have to stretch beyond you and you have to think about the bigger picture at hand. And Sister Sweat says, uh, when you're feeling upset or angry, instead of being focused on the emotion, challenge yourself to examine the root cause of that emotion and allow that emotion to be handled by the scriptures. Challenge yourself to not allow the emotion uh, to rule over you and be led uh, by the godly examples of the word instead. Okay, so I love that. This reminds me of uh, capturing every thought and making it obedient to Christ. All right, so when an, an emotion rises, you need to be able to recognize that thing and then, you know, capture that and, and make sure that you uh, have a godly response. Well, that has run us uh, against our time for the night. And I appreciate you, you guys, man. Y'all, uh, ladies and, and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, y'all always have wonderful feedback. And this is helping me grow. I hope it's helping you grow. And I hope that you all are applying these things and it's actually helping you in your walk. I am going to ask brother Henry Jones, starting lineup, if you don't mind, <laughs> close us out with a word of prayer, brother. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now just thanking you for this time and this opportunity to study your word. Lord, we just pray that you continue to be with Brother Page, not only him, but his family as well. Continue to allow him to use his gifts and his talents for your kingdom. Thank you for all his preparation and the seriousness in which he takes uh, delivering your word. Lord, we just pray that everyone at the sound of his voice will make application to their lives and that we will remember your scripture that we will not grow weary in well-doing, but in due time, it will come to fruition. Lord, we just pray that you forgive us for all of our sins, whether in word, deed, or thought, sins of omission or commission. And we just pray that you continue to be with our family, the leaders in general, and the leaders of our congregation. Be with us as we continue in your word. Most of all, thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.